children's church, have a snack, learn a lesson, sing some songs, do a craft, have a whole lot of fun. One of these weeks, I'm going to say, any adults who also want to go along to children? No, no, I'm not going to do that. Uh, I have half the church get up and leave. Um, no, very good. Thankful for that. Um, I want to start with this story this morning. You know, I have a very nice uh, laptop computer that I use for work multiple hours each and every day. Um, it's where I write my messages. It's where I send out emails. It's where my calendar and schedule is. Um, it's a very small, compact, durable computer. Uh, it fits very nicely into my laptop bag, weighs less than 10 pounds. But one thing about this laptop that just drives me nuts, it's super annoying, is that it does not have a disk drive. It doesn't have a place to put in a CD or a disk. You know, apparently as a society, uh, we're moving away from using discs anymore. You know, my kids hardly even know what a DVD is, much less a CD or even a cassette tape or, or an 8-track. Everything nowadays is streaming and on demand. But I still have several discs and DVDs that I need access to on a regular basis, and I guess I just refuse to give them up. Um, but since my laptop doesn't have a place to put those discs in, I have to have what is called an external DVD RW drive with a USB-C port in order to connect it to my computer. Now, about a month ago, I was in need of access to one of my DVDs, and I thought I already, or I knew I already had one of these external drives, but I couldn't find it anywhere. And so I spent over an hour looking all over our house and all over my office here at church for this external disk drive, but I couldn't find it. Obviously very frustrating. Well, when I'd finally given up hope, what did I do? I went on Amazon, and within five minutes, I was able to order the exact thing that I needed and had it scheduled to be delivered right to my front door, right here in Wasson, Nebraska, within a few days. And I was just thinking about how amazing th this is to have basically any material thing I want simply at my fingertips or within the click of a button. And now my kids today couldn't imagine life being any other way. Everything now is instant. We can instantly watch hundreds of different shows or movies on our TVs. Instantly play about any music you want just by saying, Alexa. <laughs> instantly pull up information about any topic imaginable on our computers or smartphones. You know, we hardly ever have arguments anymore over anything because we just look it up when we don't know, right? There, there's no reason to argue over it. Um, we can instantly know the scores of yesterday's college football games. Instantly order basically any product imaginable. This week I had the chance to ride with Tim as he was harvesting, and he instantly knows his yields and uh, how wet his corn is and, and everything else. It's all instant. And this is all good and well, and, and I'll admit I enjoy many of these instant options very much, but I think there can be a danger when we start to think that everything in life should work this way. You know, would you agree with this statement here, that the things in life that matter most, the things with the most value and significance and meaning, still take time. For example, you cannot develop deep, meaningful relationships in an instant. You cannot develop character and integrity in your life with the simple click of a button. You can't develop deep, meaningful relationship with God or become spiritually mature on Amazon. You can't develop the attributes and qualities that it takes to be an effective leader by asking Alexa. Okay, these are things that smartphones and computers and Amazon and YouTube and Hulu and Alexa can never do for you. I want this relationship to have deep trust and connection right now. 
I want to be close to God and know everything about him right now. I want to be an influential leader over large groups of people right now. But that's not usually how life works. Rather, relationships start with a little trust and grow. Spiritual maturity starts with a little faith and grows. High-quality character and integrity start with small choices to do the right thing and grows. And leadership starts with leading myself or maybe a small group in a small task and grows. This is what we're going to start seeing in the life of David and I want us to talk about today. If you have your Bibles, I would encourage you to open them to 2 Samuel chapter 2 so that you can follow along this morning um, in our study. Last week, we saw the character and, and the selfless, God-fearing leadership of David coming out as he found out about the death of King Saul and, and his three sons and began mourning the loss of God's anointed first king of Israel. David did not see Saul's death as something to be celebrated. He did not see it as a selfish opportunity for a power grab. Rather, he saw it as something that was devastating and something that needed to be respected and mourned. That's what we saw in 2 Samuel chapter 1 last week. Now, after reading chapter 1, my mind automatically thinks that chapter 2 will come with the crowning of David as king over all of Israel because that was God's plan, right? But that's not what we're going to see today. After over 10 years... Of time in the wilderness living as a fugitive it is still going to be another seven long years before David becomes king over all of Israel so follow along as I start reading here second Samuel chapter 2 starting in verse 1 it says in the course of time David inquired of the Lord shall I go up to one of the towns of Judah, he asked. The Lord said, go up. David asked, where shall I go? To Hebron, the Lord answered. So David went up there with his two wives, Ahinoam of Jezreel and Abigail, the widow of Nabal of Carmel. David also took the men who were with him, each with his family, and they settled in Hebron and its towns. Then the men of Judah came to Hebron, and there they anointed David king over the tribe of Judah. When David was told that it was the men from Jabesh-Gilead who had buried Saul, he sent messengers to them to say to them, The Lord bless you for showing this kindness to Saul your master by burying him. May the Lord now show you kindness and faithfulness, and I too will show you the same favor because you have done this. Now then, be strong and brave, for Saul your master is dead, and the people of Judah have anointed me king over them. And I'm going to stop right there. So the opening line there in verse 1 basically means that this did not happen immediately after the scene in chapter 1. But some time has now passed since then. Not really sure how much time, but David did take some time to mourn the death of King Saul and of his friend Jonathan um, but it was probably a matter of days or weeks, uh, not months or years. Then we see those five words that David has learned the importance of during his time in the wilderness. If you highlight or underline in your Bible, I would highlight these. David inquired of the Lord. He didn't try to do things or become king his own way. Rather, he sought the Lord's will. You know, if you remember in 1 Samuel... We saw this theme where David would seek the Lord and things would go well. Then David would try to take things into his own hands and things would not go well. And it kind of went back and forth. So I'm so happy here to see that David's immediate response here is to seek the Lord. And we see that God tells David to go up to Hebron. And the language here of David's taking his family and his men and their family tells us that God was tell, telling David to go live in Hebron. He was not just going there for a visit. He was not just passing through. This is where God 
was telling him to move, to settle down. Hebron was a city in Israelite territory about 20 miles south of Jerusalem and 25 miles back east from Ziklag. We have a map there. It might be kind of hard to see. Um, But Ziklag is where David and his men and their families had been living most recently, and then it was burned uh, by the Amalekites. Well, now they are moving from there back into the land of Judah, back to Hebron. And this was a very significant move because they were moving back into Israelite territory. Okay, they were taking their families home. They were going back to the land of Israel to live with and be with and worship with their people. And from the text, it appears that the men of Judah almost immediately make David king over their tribe. Now, why would this have happened so immediately? Let me remind you of a few reasons. Um, If you remember back in 1 Samuel, when David and his group of followers settled in this Philistine town of Ziklag, they started doing these raids to establish themselves, going out, raiding other areas to establish themselves, to build up um, their supplies and, and their safety. And David lied to the Philistine king, King Achish, right? He told King Achish that he was raiding Israelite towns, which obviously would have made the Philistine king very happy. But in reality, David had been raiding the enemies of Judah in order to help Judah. Then also, um, in 1 Samuel chapter 30, When David defeats the Amalekites in battle, David sent some of the spoils of the battle to the tribe of Judah. And in fact, in 1 Samuel 30, verse 31, it even specifically says that he sent some of the spoils of battle to Hebron. So all this to say that it's really not that hard to imagine why the people of Judah already trusted David and chose to almost immediately make him the king of their tribe. Um, And also, obviously, King Saul was now dead, so they were looking for a king. But I also want to make sure you understand that this is just one of the 12 tribes of Israel. Okay, this is not the instant fulfillment of the anointing that Samuel had given David as a shepherd boy. But it appears to be a small step in that direction. Okay, next we read that David is told about what the men of Jabesh Gilead had done for Saul. I I mentioned this a few weeks ago, but if you don't remember or you weren't with us, the people of Jabesh Gilead, they were relatives of King Saul. And Jabesh Gilead was east of the Jordan River, and it had been attacked by the Ammonites shortly after Saul became king. And so Saul rallied together Israel and went and helped defeat the Ammonites and protect Jabesh Gilead. That was one of the first things Saul had done when he became king. And so out of gratitude and respect for King Saul, the men of Jabesh Gilead had gone to Philistine territory and retrieved the bodies of Saul and his sons from Bashan um, so that the Philistines couldn't make any more sport of their bodies. And they took their bodies back to Jabesh, burned them, and buried the bones. So David finds out about this, and he sends this blessing and this offer of friendship to the people of Jabesh Gilead. Now, this detail is important because if you remember, most of the northern kingdom of Israel was now occupied by Philistines up to the Jordan River. But there were apparently still some Israelite cities to the east of the Jordan. So this was no small thing for David to offer them this blessing. Um, This was also a very kingly move by David to start to win some favor in other areas outside of Judah, north of Judah. So this all seems good and well. David's the king of the tribe of Judah. He sends this blessing to Jabesh Gilead. His family is now moved back to their homeland, to their home country. This all seems to be moving in the right direction, right? Then we get to verse 8. Meanwhile, dun dun dun. <laughs> Meanwhile, Abner, son of Ner, the commander of Saul's army, 
had taken Ishbosheth, son of Saul, and brought him over to Mahanaim. He made him king over Gilead, Ashurai, and Jezreel, and also over Ephraim, Benjamin, and all Israel. Verse 10, Ishbosheth, son of Saul, was 40 years old when he became king over Israel, and he reigned two years. The tribe of Judah, however, remained loyal to David. The length of time David was king in Hebron over Judah was seven years and six months. Okay, so back in 1 Samuel, when Saul becomes king, we are told that he has three sons. Okay, all three of whom died with Saul in battle. All three of Saul's sons died with him in battle. However, after becoming king, Saul had a fourth son whose name was Ishbosheth. Now, there really isn't a reason given as to why Ishbosheth wasn't also killed in battle with Saul. But if you look at the way Ishbosheth is depicted in 2 Samuel, it would appear that he was kind of a coward. Okay, he wasn't a warrior like Saul's other sons. Notice that it isn't Ishbosheth that makes himself king. Okay, rather Abner, the commander of Saul's army, takes Ishbosheth and makes him the king. Now, from a human perspective in the ancient world, this would have made sense, right? When a king dies, his son would become the next king. But as we know, this wasn't God's plan. So here we have kind of this tension between the plans and the will of man and the plans and the will of God. And it's pretty obvious here that Abner is really the one behind all of this. Okay, Ishbosheth is just the means or we might say the puppet <laughs> that Abner is using to do his will. Now, Abner has been around a long time, I'll remind you. He was Saul's cousin. He would have been there when David defeated Goliath. He was also there when David had gone into Saul's camp when Saul was sleeping and taken his spear and his water jug, but spared Saul's life. And if you remember in that scene, when David is far off from the camp, he calls out, and he doesn't call out to King Saul. Who does he call out to? He calls out to Abner and rebukes him and says, Abner, you're not doing your job. You're not doing a very good job protecting King Saul. So all that to say, Abner obviously was not a fan of David, and so it should not surprise us that he was going to do whatever was in his power to not turn the kingdom over to David. So Abner has Ishbosheth as the king in the north, and David is now king over this one tribe of Judah in the south. Dun dun dun. <laughs> now I want to make clear here that apparently it took five years for Abner to win some of the northern kingdom back uh, from the Philistines before he made Ishbosheth king in the north. And the reason I say this is because David was king in Judah for seven and a half years, but Ishbosheth was only king in the north for the last two years of that time. And so what we're going to read here happened in the last two years of that time. Okay, we read about basically a civil war that ensues after Ishbosheth becomes king of the north. Verse 12 Abner, son of Ner, together with the men of Ishbosheth, son of Saul, left Mahinaim and went to Gibeon. Joab, son of Zeruiah, and David's men, that's David's sister, right? And David's men went out and met them at the pool of Gibeon. One group sat down on one side of the pool, and one group sat down on the other side. Okay, I've heard the pool of Gibeon is still there. Rod and Betty, did you get to see that when you were over there? Don't think so? Okay, I've heard it's pretty cool to see. It's, um, it's just north of Jerusalem. Anyway, let's keep reading. They're, they're at the pool of, of Gibeon there. Verse 14, Then Abner said to Joab, Let's have some of the young men get up and fight hand to hand in front of us. All right, let them do it, Joab said. So they stood up and were counted off. Twelve men from Benjamin and Ishbosheth, son of Saul, and twelve from David. 
Then each man grabbed his opponent by the head and thrust his dagger into his opponent's side, and they fell down together. So that place in Gibeon was called Helkath Hazurim, which means field of daggers. The battle that day was fierce in Abner, and the Israelites were defeated by David's men. Okay, so you have Abner, Saul's cousin, moving south with his troops. And Joab, David's nephew, moving north with his troops. And they meet up at the pool of Gibeon. Okay? Um, maybe they do a little trash talking from across the pool, and they decide to have a fight between 12 men from each side. Then we read, interesting, apparently all 24 of those men died. So then, in verse 17, after that event, a battle took place, and Joab and David's men defeat Abner and the men from the north. Verse 18. Uh, the three sons of Zariah, which is David's sister, were there. Joab, Abishai, and Asael. Now Asael was, a fleet, was as fleet-footed as a wild gazelle. He chased Abner, turning neither to the right nor to the left as he pursued him. Abner looked behind him and said, Is that you, Asael? It is, he answered. Then Abner said to him, as he's running, okay, imagine this, it's kind of almost funny. Um, as he's running, he says to him, turn aside to the right or to the left. Take on one of the young men and strip him of his weapons. But Asael would not stop chasing him. Again, Abner warned Asael, stop chasing me. Why should I strike you down? How could I look your brother Joab? In the face, verse 23, but Asael refused to give up the pursuit. So Abner thrust the butt of his spear into Asael's stomach, and the spear came out through his back. He fell there and died on the spot. And every man stopped when he came to the place where Asael had fallen and died. So basically, after this battle by the pool, Abner and his troops retreat. They take off running to the north, and Joab and David's troops start to chase them, apparently mostly on foot. And apparently David's nephew, Asael, was the fastest one, and so he's chasing down Abner, okay, passing other people. And Abner, a little bit older at this point, tries to convince Asael to stop chasing him. He doesn't want to fight him. You know, I think Abner knew that if he kills Asael, that would be picking a fight with Joab and David, and that wasn't going to be good for him. But Asael wouldn't stop chasing, and so eventually Abner either turns around or without turning around, kills him. And then that last sentence of verse 23, we see that it's almost like the rest of Joab's pursuing party get to that place and they stop. They see Asael dead. They realize the weight of what's happening. But I guess that just makes them even more mad because the chase continues. Verse 24. But Joab and Abishai pursued Abner. And as the sun was setting, they came to the hill of Amma near Gia, and on the way to the wasteland of Gibeon. Then the men of Benjamin rallied behind Abner. They formed themselves into a group and took their stand on top of a hill. Abner called out to Joab, Must the sword devour forever? Don't you realize that this will end in bitterness? How long before you order your men to stop pursuing their fellow Israelites? Joab answered, As surely as God lived, if you had not spoken, the men would have continued pursuing them until morning. So Joab blew the trumpet, and all the troops came to a halt. They no longer pursued Israel, nor did they fight anymore. All that night, Abner and his men marched through the Arabah. They crossed the Jordan and continued through the morning hours and came to Mahanaim. So as this chase continues, Abner gets far enough back that he's able to, to form his troops from Benjamin, and they get to this high spot and line up on the hill, and they cry out, he cries out, this plea to Joab. And basically, Abner says to Joab, if this doesn't stop, we're going to all kill each other. Israelite killing Israelite. 
And Joab hears this, he thinks about it, and apparently he agrees with Abner's conclusion. So he blows his horn, and the men of Judah stop pursuing them, and everybody kind of heads for home. Verse 30, let's read the end here. Then Joab stopped pursuing Abner and assembled the whole army. Besides Asael, 19 of David's men were found missing. But David's men had killed 360 Benjamites who were with Abner. They took Asael and buried him in his father's tomb at Bethlehem. Then Joab and his men marched all night and arrived at Hebron by daybreak. So on their way back to Hebron, they, they are counting the dead bodies. And they find that David's army had lost 19 plus Asael, so 20. And Ishbosheth, or really Abner's army, had lost 360 soldiers. Wow. Where's this going to go from here? This civil war. David, king in the south. Ishbosheth and Abner, king in the north. David's nephew, dead on the battlefield. 360 of Ishbosheth's truths dead as well. What's going to happen next? Well, we'll have to wait till next week to find that out. <laughs> but what can and should we take away? What lesson can we learn here from chapter 2? Well, the first question that comes to my mind after reading this chapter is what are we to think about all these Israelites fighting one another? And the bloodshed of their own people. Okay, I don't think there's any way that any of this was honoring God. He does not want his own people fighting or killing each other, and yet that's exactly what was taking place. And I would say that what we read here in this chapter is really still the consequence of decisions that were made 40 years earlier. If you remember, back when the nation of Israel decided that they did not want God to be their king anymore, they instead wanted a human king. They wanted to be like every other nation. At that point, God said to Samuel in 1 Samuel 8, verse 7, this is what God said to Samuel. The Lord told him, listen to all the people are saying to you. It is not you, Samuel, they have rejected. They have rejected me as their king. You know, even today, church, we sadly see fighting among God's people. And I, I don't mean the Israelites. I mean believers in Christ. And at the root of the fighting is often, if not always, an unwillingness by one or both parties to submit to God as king. I want to do things my way. Or I want to be like everybody else in the world. Or I want to be my own king. And this attitude, just like with the Israelites, never leads to God being glorified. It leads to division within the body of Christ. It leads to brother fighting brother, sister fighting sister, believer fighting believer. And then the second thing that I take away from this is just how much leadership matters. I cannot help but keep thinking about how much different this story could have been if Saul had been a leader with courage and integrity and a heart for the Lord. The decisions that Saul had made for the last 40, more specifically the last 10 plus years, were still having huge ramifications even after his death. You know, there is a tension in our story between the sovereign will of God, which he is working out in his timing, we know what it is for David to be the next king, and then the fallen free will of man. God has sovereignly appointed David the next king of Israel, and he is still working that out in his perfect timing. But all along, all along the way, we see men like Abner and Joab and even David at times, exercising their own free will and doing things their own way, and that does not honor God, and that keeps leading to trouble and division and even death. And you know, I see the exact same thing happening in our culture today. I believe with everything in me 
that God is sovereignly working out his plan in our world today. His plan of salvation, his plan to get the gospel message to every tribe, tongue, and nation, his plan to build his church, God is sovereignly working that out. And yet all along the way, we see people and leaders and sometimes even ourselves going against the will of God and this always leads to nothing but trouble and chaos and division. You know, there's a verse in 1 Peter 5, verse 6. It says, Humble yourself, therefore, under God's mighty hand, that he may lift you up. And look at those last three words. In due time. You see, the timetable is always up to God. God wants to use each and every one of us in this room and each and every one that may be watching online. God wants to use us as leaders in gospel proclamation, leaders in our families, leaders in our churches, leaders in our workplaces, leaders in our communities. But God is going to do this on his timetable, not ours. The leadership and the impact don't always come instantaneously like we think they should in the case of david it was about 25 years from when samuel anointed him the next king of israel to when it actually happened god is at work in each and every one of us if we will let him growing us maturing us changing us building faith inside of us and he wants to use us in his special way but he also wants to use us in his time. And we cannot try to instify God's timing. That's probably not even a word, but you get what I'm saying. <laughs> okay, but, but if we're unable or unwilling to be faithful and obedient and patient in our current circumstances as they are today, there is no reason to think that God will, will give us more. Our responsibility as believers in Christ is to humble ourselves under God's mighty hand and allow him to lift us up instantly. No. <laughs> allow him to lift us up in our time. No. Allow him to lift us up in due time, in his perfect timing. We have to learn to trust the timing of God the sovereign will of God and not try to take it into our own hands. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, I, I thank you for this reminder this morning that you are always at work. And God, when, when we seek you, when we trust your will, when we trust your plan, and sometimes most importantly, when we trust your timing, you will use us to your honor and your glory. But God, so often we struggle with that. As humans, we, we, we selfishly and naturally and due to our sin nature, we want control. And we might want to do your will, but we want to do it in our timing. We just want you to execute what we think is best. God, may we learn from the example of the story of David here that your timing is always what's best. And just as much as submitting to your will, we have to learn to submit to your timing. I pray that you would help each and every one to do just that, to trust you, to trust that your timing, your will is best. Because God, it says in your word that to you, a thousand years can be like one moment, and one moment can be like a thousand years. You don't operate on our timetable. Help us to trust you. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen.